well, time for a drop of petrol, unleaded of course. Now, this time last year, the sales of unleaded were only about 1% of the total, although there was a lot of interest. We had over 7,000 requests for these information leaflets when we did an item last October. Since then, sales have soared to 25%, but there they seem to have levelled off, much to the dismay of the oil companies who have really geared themselves up. Now, the problem seems to be confusion rather than unwillingness, because a recent survey by the RSC showed that six out of ten motorists still weren't sure whether their car could use unleaded or not. Ironically, the situation hasn't been helped by the introduction of high-octane unleaded petrol. BP was first with the introduction of Super Green, as we showed last spring. So Tom Bosler has been taking another look at the mysteries of going green. Once upon a time, there used to be two-star, three-star and four-star petrol. Varying octane ratings for varying power output. Three Star dropped out, and in the last year, Two Star has been largely replaced by Unleaded. Now, Unleaded is not equivalent to Four Star, so to switch to it, some cars need their timing adjusted, and that might have meant a loss of power and fuel economy. But have motorists noticed the difference? Um, there's no difference in the performance. I think so at the start. It seemed a bit sluggish, but since then I've not noticed. Better for the environment. I think so, it's better for the car, it's better for the environment. It's probably better for everybody, isn't it? On some cars, switching to unleaded petrol is not just a simple matter of one or two adjustments. The lead in the fuel also acts as a lubricant for the valves and seats. On this MGB head, for instance, the valve seats have to be machined out and replaced with some specially hardened inserts. And unless that is done, the wear on the head will be about three times more than normal. Now, one solution could be to every so often put in a tank full of leaded petrol, but of course that still pollutes the atmosphere. A much better solution would be to use one of these non-toxic, lead-free additives. This shouldn't really be necessary because the, the technology of getting valve lubrication without lead is well known. Uh, additives should be added uh, at the refinery, uh, as is now being done in Europe and the United States. If motorists in Britain could buy unleaded petrol with those sort of additives now, then a lot of confusion would be saved and maybe a lot of money. I, for one, would have been saved over £200 having the head on this engine and the timing modified. But some cars, like most Jaguars for instance, can't be adjusted to take 95 octane unleaded fuel. They need a full 98 octane. Oil companies know how to make high-octane unleaded petrol, incorporating valve lubricants that would be suitable for all cars now on the road without any adjustment. They would run more economically and clean more cleanly for the environment. In fact, Amoco have been selling a full range of unleaded petrols in the USA for 60 years, until recently using the slogan, the only one certified lead-free. So why haven't the oil companies done it here? And why didn't they sell the high-octane super unleaded to start with anyway? With a 10p tax advantage, it still sells for two pence less than the four-star leaded. The costs of making high-octane unleaded petrol have been grossly exaggerated. At the most, three p a gallon, probably uh, much less than that. And the motorist would save at least that amount, as shown by studies in the United States, because of reduced uh, motoring costs. We put some of these points to the oil company. First of all, has there been an exaggeration in the production costs of unleaded fuel? Mobile told us. It's down to market prices, really. There's no exaggeration in prices at the pumps. The price of oil is determined by the international market and not by the individual oil companies. So why didn't we go straight to super unleaded? BP told us it wasn't our decision. The government laid down the standards for the existing unleaded fuel and there isn't even now a standard for super unleaded. But what about a substitute for lead as a lubricant? Esso told us, if we could find an additive that would suit all cars, then of course we would use it. What a market! We would do it. If it were that simple, we would have done it already. But Amoco still haven't produced a high-octane unleaded fuel for Britain. Why? They say the market is already confused and the introduction of another grade of unleaded fuel would confuse it further. So where does that leave us, the ordinary motorist? Basically there are just two categories. If your car has been modified, as has this particular Sierra, to take unleaded petrol, then you can use super unleaded any time you like. But you won't get the advantage of that extra octane level 
unless you have the car return to the original settings. If, on the other hand, like with this particular Cavalier, your car has not been adjusted to take unleaded petrol, then, of course, you can still use super unleaded. The Cavalier doesn't require any additives, but your particular car may require a lead substitute. And if it does, you'll have to continue adding that substitute until such time as the oil companies put it in the petrol for you. Well, look, if the oil industry decided to get its act together, they could perfectly well manufacture a high-octane, unleaded petrol, with, with incorporating suitable valve lubricants, which would be suitable for all cars now on the road, without any adjustment. And what's more, they would run better, more cheaply, with reduced maintenance costs. And that means that we could then put a padlock on all the leaded pumps. They'd no longer be necessary. Quite obsolete. And if you're still in doubt, then you should ask your dealer about your particular car. Meanwhile, we'd like to hear from you about your experiences with or without unleaded petrol, why you haven't changed over, why you have, the effect it's had on your motoring. I'll give you the address later on. But now to less controversial matters, Jeremy Clarkson's been to a sale at the National Motor Museum at Bewley, which turned out to be light years away from a conventional classic car auction. <laughs>